slightly different role here, I think. Uh, I'm not advocating a model, per se. I'm trying to put a model on the table that has sort of been discarded, I guess, in a sense, uh, and that's uh, state direct ownership of, of corporations. Uh, very common throughout the world, actually, uh, but hard, hardly the part of the discussion here. So even, even though um, the United States presently is mm -hmm. the owner of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, fairly large corporations, uh, until recently was a 60% owner of General Motors, uh, was a minority, large sort of controlling owner of Citicorp and some of the other banks. Uh, we don't think of this as, as an actual strategy or policy option uh, for controlling growth or uh, transforming the economy. So most of my research typically is on the type of things that Marjorie and and Chris and uh, you know, Richard talked about, but I, I think it's important to have this as part of the discussion. And that's that's sort of the goal here. So I mean, the, and so I thought I'd try to maybe bust a couple of myths, you know, that may be in the room. Uh, one is that uh, uh, state-owned enterprises really don't exist anymore. Um, so I was just looking at this thing from uh, National Public Radio and noted that. The Forbes Global 2000 that uh, there are uh, 117 state-owned and public companies from Brazil, Russia, India, and China that appeared on the Fortune Global 2000 list of 2,000 largest companies in the world uh, that are state-owned uh, between 2017. Uh, between 2004 and 2008, they appeared for the first time. In other words, they're growing. Um, actually, in the 2009 Global Four. 2000, uh, ICBC, China Mobile, and PetroChina were among the top five companies by market value in the world. So three of the top five largest companies in the world are state-owned companies at present. Um, so just, so not not quite uh, as passe as, as we think. Uh, actually a fairly major part and a growing part of the global economy. Um, it's also... Yeah, China Mobile, they have about 400 million cell phone customers. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one point I'll make. Uh, second, they're not as inefficient as, as we think. They're also not marvels of efficiency. But um, one of the places where we, we, everyone knows that um, public corporations were inefficient because Margaret Thatcher, of course, um, you know, saved Britain by getting rid of a lot of state-owned enterprises was Britain. So you would have thought, if you looked at the historical record of public enterprise in Britain, you would have found them to be inefficient. Um, and in fact, uh, Robert Billward, who was an economist, did a comparison between 1950 and 1985, looking at the United States and private companies and comparable publicly owned companies in Britain. And what he found was that annual productivity growth in the English public sector, mining, utilities, transportation, and communications companies consistently exceeded private sector productivity growth of those same industries in the United States. And this is, of course, during the uh, golden era of U.S. economic growth, at least both of it from 50 to 1975, certainly. Um, so there are certainly a lot of problems we can talk about with private enter uh, public enterprises, but the, the truth is on, on a overall level, um, relatively comparable in terms of efficiency. Um, now, they're definitely not miracle workers. We can talk about a number of problems with public enterprises that sort of state a few of the obvious ones. Uh, there can be a problem of the, the lack of a threat of failure. It's hard for a state enterprise to go bankrupt. Can happen, but difficult. Um, it can be harder to change personnel if you need to, depending on civil service rules. It can, uh, you can have bureaucratic power grabs where, where managers are seeking to you know, expand the size of the company by the increasing number of employees rather than by being more productive. Um, you can uh, have the government unfairly favor the, the government-owned company over private companies in, in, in terms of procurement or other things. Um, so. It's not a, a panacea. Nonetheless, the, the record of public enterprises 
fairly substantial. Um, and as I said, it's a growing sector in the world economy. Uh, so why, so why would we want to look at this in the new economy group, and and what, you know, how does this fit into the picture? Um, there is nothing magically beneficial about public enterprise, but what it can do is allow for um, public goals to be implemented directly through business. Um, so there, you can find plenty of public enterprises that have poor environmental records, but just like you can find many democratic governments that have poor environmental records generally. Um, but a, de a democratic government that chooses to prioritize the environment has a greater ability to enact its policy preferences if it owns some companies in key sectors than if it doesn't. Um, you can find other examples where um, public ownership has made a difference in terms of social criteria. In particular, in Sweden and Norway, it's a priority of the government, and the government, the state sector in Sweden and Norway happens to be the largest single owner of companies in those two countries. Um, that they've made a priority that uh, there should be gender parity on the board of directors of state-owned companies, and therefore there is gender parity on the board of directors of state-owned companies, unlike private companies in Sweden and Norway. So, I mean, there they've made a policy choice, and, and it's had a, a noticeable impact on who is making decisions at the board of directors' table. Um, what, have been, what are some of the areas that we might want to think about Public enterprise. I think that's hopefully part of this discussion. Um, you know, in, in some areas where possible, my sort of bias, I guess, is to try to use co-op and local owners where possible. Uh, but um, I'll show those charts here. So, just up here quickly, you can see at present in the United States, um, about a much, about 50 percent of public private sector employment is of uh, firms of 500 or more. And that that's actually increased over time slightly, from about 48% to about 51% from 1995 to 2008. Uh, next slide. Um, so how large is very large? Well, um, if you look at it, uh, about uh, 33 million jobs in the United States in the private sector are in firms with 10,000 employees or more, and another 28 million or so in firms between 500 and 1,000. Uh, and uh, just to show it in percentage terms on the last slide, 27.3% uh, of all private sector jobs in the United States are, are firms over uh, over 10,000 people. Uh, if you added, as, as uh, Dr. Alperovitz said earlier, uh, 5,000, you get about a third, or 33%, and the other 23.3%, so roughly half of jobs are over 500. Uh, so that's the, uh, so it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to break down all of those sectors. Um, so how do you choose? What are sort of some of the main reasons why you might want to use a, a public sector company? And, and basically, the traditional strategies that we've used in the United States, of course, have not been public enterprise, although you can find examples. Uh, there are 2,000 muni uh, municipally owned electric companies in the United States with uh, something on the order of 40 to 50 million customers uh, across the country, for example. Major cities like Los Angeles, um, Austin, Texas, Sacramento uh, have public companies. Um, but typically our, our strategies have been either regulation or antitrust, um, both of which um, have their pluses and minuses. Uh, and, and most economic theory will say that from a theoretical standpoint, uh, there's you have to look case by case as to whether regulation or ownership makes the most sense. There's no, the free market, uh, so-called, uh, even in neoclassical accounts, if it's a monopoly type situation, offers no uh, direct benefit um, over public ownership, um, according to the standard economic, the standard neoclassical economic theory. Uh, so, yeah. One of the goals of uh, public ownership is to, what, so what are some of the benefits? Um, well, one, one reason to have public ownership is to avoid monopolies. A uh, second can be to provide public goods. Uh, a third can be to promote underproduction of, of socially desirable goods, such as health and education being obvious examples. Um, a fourth can be to provide a reinsurance function, and, and these all come from uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, certainly within the 
mainstream of, of the economics profession. Um, a few other things to think about in terms of communities. Um, one is that you may want to use, if there's a, um, a crisis situation or a situation that's a uh, priority sector, such as the need to reduce carbon emissions by 8% over the next four decades. Uh, it's unlikely you're going to have a market solution to that. So uh, having a national champion type of situation uh, is an effective strategy to propel development. And we've seen this in U.S. history, you know, for good or for ill. Um, example being, of course, the Manhattan Project in terms of World War II. Um, a second... In general, the whole war production effort was a lot of uh, public Exactly right, yeah. Um, second, uh, you can have, it uh, can be effective strategy for regional development and, and for being able to choose uh, where to site production. Uh, one of the major problems we face in terms of the environment uh, is that we have what, what uh, we often call throwaway cities. So uh, Detroit, for example, in the last census lost 25% of its population from 2000 to 2010, it's now at 700,000 from a peak of close to 2 million. Well, that's a lot of buildings and structures that were built, that have been dismantled, and built somewhere else because the population of our country has gone up, not down during that period. So you can use public ownership as a tool to plan the location of, of production and, and do regional development strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I'll mention is you can in some cases, there's a need to sort of remove uh, corporate power specifically that's blocking change. Um, so is it efficient to be fighting every single coal project, or are you better off taking over a, a coal company and, and working with the workforce to phase out that industry in a way that doesn't uh, destroy communities and livelihoods? Um, is, it, is it helpful to... Um, if, if you're trying to shift from oil production, would most most state owned most oil companies actually in the world are state owned already? Is, is it helpful to have Exxon Mobil fighting you every step of the way as you're trying to shift the um, economy? Is it is it helpful to have? Uh, I think was it the top ten banks now have ninety percent of the assets? If I remember the number right of uh, financial sector assets in the United States, is, is that helping us uh, with the allocation of capital between industries? And if it's not, uh, then then I think public ownership, at least in some cases, has to be on the table. So I think I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to questions.